Okay, so um, Professor Keith Ellen or Kurt Ellenberger got back to me, the music professor, um, saying that um, he was gonna um, consider my research more because he had he has a minor in physics, and so he's very interested in acoustics and. Um, so he then inspired me to, as I mentioned in the last video, uh, this, discover this explanation of the, what I had been calling the, the Hempel effect, which is this idea that when you have the first three overtones, the, the, um, or the first three partials, the, the, um, uh, fundamental tone, the octave, and the perfect fifth, when you do a phase shift, then the amplitude in the Fourier spectrogram, it it looks completely different because you're getting destructive interference. But when you listen to it, uh, you're not able to hear the difference because it's still a perfect fifth, but now it's an undertone to the octave. And so the pitch has actually changed because it's now it's a a if the root if the fundamental tone was C and the octave is C then the perfect fifth as an overtone would be G is three halves but when you shift the phase then now it's an undertone of the octave so it would be an F to the octave which would actually be four thirds instead of um, <clears throat> two thirds because you're trying to you're trying to use logarithms to put it on the same scale of the octave. And so um, it turns out that there was a big debate between um, Koenig and Hemholtz about whether you can hear the phase shift or not. And Hemholtz actually won, they won the debate because people could hear the difference between the perfect fifth as a overtone and, and then the perfect fifth as an undertone. But then later research argued that actually what's happening is there's a distortion in the recording that causes a group delay. <clears throat> so, so the, um, the, what this means is that the fundamental is getting canceled out due to a a um, group delay in the wave. So there's a phase shift that cancels out the fundamental, and that that thereby causes the octave to be heard instead of the fundamental. And so that that's what enables the perfect fifth to be heard as an undertone of the octave, which is actually the perfect fourth by changing. Um, changing direction in time. So my argument was that this group delay is actually due to the superluminal phase shift that uh, Gunter Nimps discovered, the physicist. And so I looked back and I, I had uploaded a review of his book. And so I rewatched the upload so I could remind myself of the explanation and then I found the quote in the comments and I posted that video like 10 months ago. It seems like forever, but it wasn't that long ago. And um, essentially what he's, what he's stating exactly the same thing, that there's a group delay. There's a group delay because the phase, um, the phase shift causes the phase to be faster than the center of the mass of the signal. And so this is Gunter Nimps's argument is that normally when you have a signal processing using a digital signal based on a square wave, but when you're using a um, natural overtones as a natural resonance, um, then the phase is can be the signal because the phase is actually, it, it ends up being the inverse of the frequency so you have, when you take the reciprocal of the frequency, that's due to the phase shift, um, just as the two-thirds and the three-halves are inverse to each other as the perfect fifth. 
And so this phase shift then causes the group signal, which would normally be how you derive the amplitude for the signal by um, based on this logarithmic squaring to get the amplitude. And so since you're no longer relying on the amplitude for the signal, but instead the inverse of the frequency as the phase shift, then you have this um, superluminal signal that's faster than the energy as the amplitude. And so this is what um, Louis de Broglie had originally discovered when he critiqued relativity, is that he realized that as a particle goes towards the speed of light, then the frequency goes up. But the um, time also gets bigger because the time slows down as relativity. And that goes against the fundamental principle of frequency being inverse to time from Pythagoras. And therefore, logically, there has to be a second time from the future that's a time-reversed signal um, which with a negative frequency. And so this is... This is what I've been arguing, what I called the Hempel effect, because what Philolaus did originally in order to create the irrational magnitude for Western science is he did a bait and switch by changing the fundamental tone. So in order to create the four thirds as the perfect fourth, he used a different root tonic of zero to eight by flipping his musical instrument around his lyre. So that's why I call him the lyre of the liar. And um, so when he flipped the instrument around, then he was able to use zero to eight as the root tonic instead of zero to 12. And by using zero to eight, then he was able to establish um, six eighths as a wavelength for the, or three fourths for the four thirds frequency, and then add that back to the um, eight twelfths wavelength of the 12 eighths frequency, which is three halves. So then you have the very first logarithm as um, eight six plus um, 12, 12 eighths equals the octave as the geometric mean squared. And this is what Architas then built on Philolaus to argue that if you take the eight to nine ratio, so you have a compound ratio of 8 is to x as x is to 9. There's no um, rational number for that solution and therefore it has to be irrational geometric magnitude that they called a logon and so that was the original um, irrational magnitude because Phil Laius was the first to use the term magnitude in reference to ratios as numbers. And so then since you could um, then uh, plot the, the ratios, you know, geometrically, then you could, you could then prove that the, that the, um, the, the major second interval as nine eighths then is the basis for the irrational magnitude. So that, so then when you cube nine eighths, you get the square root of two is the first first approximation for that. So that's the secret origin of the Pythagorean theorem. But what it's covering up is that there's actually this inherent, the root tonic has to be changed to do that so that you can get four thirds instead of the phase shift of two thirds, which is non-commutative to the three halves. So in other words, the when you're, when you're um, honest, honest about the phase shift, then you have to confront the fact that the, the, the fundamental tone as the root tonic is not a materialistic wavelength anymore. It's not an external observation, but what it is is rather this superluminal sound signal from the future going into the past as a time-reversed signal. It, or in other words, like an undertone, an undertone of the octave instead of the overtone of the fundamental tone. It's it's actually it's an undertone of a of the root tonic that doesn't exist as a physical vibration of a medium. And so you can you can then um, 
engage with this directly through meditation because you're relying on the source of sound based on listening instead of trying to externally measure sound as a physical medium. And so that's why uh, quantum biology has rediscovered that the source of our perceptions is due to this non-locality of the future and the past overlapping. And so that's what uh, Guter Nymphs has been able to recreate by utilizing um, constructive and reconstructive um, negative refractive indexes, uh, taking advantage of the different um, the, the the different density of mediums. So using air versus a prism crystal, and and this causing the phase shift, causing the necessary phase shift as the reciprocal frequency that therefore um, causes a superluminal phase signal that's reciprocal to the frequency signal inside the group wave that normally would be measured just by amplitude. And so then you can make the same analogy to quantum physics because normally in quantum physics, you don't measure the particle or the momentum until you square the amplitude which would be this group wave in Fourier analysis. But when you have Fourier analysis, you're shifting between frequency and amplitude. But when you shift between frequency and time, it's inherently uncertain due to the symmetric um, space-time symmetry that's assumed you know, from this irrational magnitude, this squaring originally from Philolaeus and Architas, and then promoted by Plato, and then rediscovered by Newton for his inverse square law. So that's the origin of the center of the mass. And so what um, Gerard de Hooft is arguing with his Light is Heavy paper with Martin Vandermark is that the, the Louis de Broglie-Einstein uh, relation proves that light inherently has gravitational mass because of this, um, you don't, you're not, you're no longer relying on the center of mass to measure the momentum of light because the momentum is directly from the frequency. And so just because you, you have to try to contain light in a box in order to assume it has inertial mass based on its momentum. But in fact, the, the momentum isn't measured by, as a center of the box it's measured due to the inherent frequency of the light itself. And so when you rely on that inherent frequency, as um, Heisenberg discovered, it's actually this non-commutative, you know, what they call the quantum leaps as a Planck's constant. And so the origin of those, of that Planck's constant, when you get rid of the assumption of a seconds, seconds as the unit, it has an inherent um, non-commutative time frequency resonance with the, the past and the future overlapping. You know, so th this is what they call a quantum two sphere. So it's inherently a discrete uh, algebraic ratio process. Um, and that's what Alain Kahn just calls two, three infinity because it's originally you can model it through music theory. So you have the you have the 3 to the um, 12th against the 2 to the 19th. But the, the 2 to the 19th originates from the 3 halves. So the 3 halves is added to the 2 to the 7th. You take the 2, and that 7th then is actually, when you divide it back into the octave, it's non-commutative due to the chromatic 12-note um, scale. So the 7th interval is actually the perfect 5th as 3 halves. It's inherent, it's hidden in that octave um, going to the seventh power. So what um, Professor Kurt Ellenberger has been arguing is the typical claim that the octave is the um, acoustic behavioral listening process that we assume the octave is the same pitch um, as a uh, exponential binary sequence. So it'd be y equals x to the 
um, or two to the X. But um, in fact, what's happening is that you have this octave being canceled out due to the non-commutative time frequency uh, phase shift. It's, it's an inherent asymmetric time as a eternal process. And um, so like in the traditional Chinese scale, they don't use a symmetric octave. They assume, they assume the truth of the Pythagorean scale that just continues infinitely as either two thirds or three halves. Um, and so the ratios are go, they go, uh, when you invert the exponentials, they're non-commutative because of that perfect fifth is the seventh uh, chromatic scale number. So you have the, instead of just adding the logarithms, you know, like normally it'd be three halves to the uh, 12th against two to the seventh. But what they, in the Western physics, then they just assume it's a logarithm. So they add the two of, of the fraction to the two as the octave. So then you have two to the 19th, two to the, two to the 19th and three to the 12th. But then when you invert it back into the scale, it's actually um, two to the one twelfth and three to the one nineteenth. And what that's what that's demonstrating is actually this inherent non-commutative phase that's non-local because it has a um, the exponential growth of the function by inverting it back into the octave has has a geometric dimension of less less than zero or less than, you know, converging to zero. It's, it's, a. Uh, I think, I don't know if Khan says it's less than zero, but it, but it's, it's never zero because it's this discrete, it's never a point in the geometric continuum. It's this algebraic process um, before any space time is measured as a geometric observation. So you have this inherent fundamental time or primitive time, um, primordial time that's existing on its own and guiding, guiding matter from the future. And then um, through meditation, you can listen to that inherently um, by assuming there's no f physical medium for the source of sound. So the superluminal sound signal, uh, Professor Gunter Nimps, he says that this is going on all the time around us only on a imperceptible level because of this group group delay as a negative refractive index but it's actually inherent to the listening process itself because the um the phase shift is inherent to the the fact that the fundamental tonic doesn't exist as a physical medium so you, you have fundamental time existing on its own as, a, as an asymmetric time shift and that's always, um, you know, guiding, guiding reality through, even through light. So the, the gravitational mass of light is due to this asymmetrical time shift with the frequency of the light. And so it's, doesn't, it doesn't depend on the observable of the, um, momentum or the particle as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but rather when you measure the momentum or the particle, assuming a collapse of the wave function, that also assumes that the other factor is, is still in this non-local superposition. And this was explained in the recent uh, quantum sense video on the uncertainty principle and the commutator. And so but it's when when you do that using the Heisenberg matrices math, then you're assuming that the rest of the matrices instantly becomes zero as a probability of the when you're multiplying the inner cross products of the matrices. So it's non-commutative, but it's also um, in an uncertainty. But what's happening actually is that the the diagonal of the matrices, um, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to, you don't have to measure it 
as a um, squaring of the amplitude. You can, you can, so you don't need to have the zero in the rest of the matrices. The um, the um, the non-commutative phase of the imaginary number is actually, as math professor Luke Hoffman proves, it de it's derived from an algebraic process of rational rational numbers. So you, normally when we think of a complex number, we assume it, there has to be a, um, a real number that's irrational, but actually, as Alan Kahn explains, the rational numbers are more dense than the geometric space-time continuum. The non-commutative rational numbers are, as discrete numbers are more dense because of this overlapping of the future and the past in t in fundamental time. And so then um, the, the uh, as Luke, Luke Hoffman has derived, you just have this algebraic time sh shift, phase shift that's asymmetric. And so the imaginary number is actually derived from a eternal um, negative and positive one you know, phase shift that's going on all the time. So every time you make a measurement, then that it takes time to do that. And when you do that, that means that you inherently have a, you're a part of the process of the asymmetric time shift. And so what um, Basil J. Hiley calls the quantum potential is actually the environment of information, active information that any matter exists within. So when a particle goes through like the one, slit of the double slit experiment. It knows whether the other slit is open or not due to this quantum potential from the future. So the, the modular momentum is actually the, the overlapping of the future and the past as a non-local guiding of the particle. Um, and that, that determines the trajectory of the particle. Um, and this has been experimentally proven with the weak measurement uh, research of uh, Yakir Aranov and his uh, research team. And um, so Basil J. Hiley is now doing that same research with them. Um, I think his name is Blake. Their last name is Blake. And it's uh, they're testing um, argon, I think, is the... They want to use, you know, an actual particle instead of, or uh, actual atom, you know, instead of just a um, force, force particle, boson, electromagnetic particle. <laughs> so that pretty much ties together this group delay explanation of the, what I call the Hempel effect of the phase, um, non-commutative phase of the perfect fifth and Alain Khan, you know, calling it 2-3 infinity and it ties it in with this group delay um, wave um, analysis of Gunter Nymphs but, but as Basil J. Hiley points out, there's no need to have any wave function because there's no need to square the amplitude as a probability you just you just have the um, quantum algebra that's non-commutative itself, and that will um, that will recreate the quantum measurement of a particle or its momentum as a commutative limit. But it won't. It's not necessary to use any kind of um, probability um, wave function. Um, but the thing is, is that when you do the algebra, you're taking, to a, taking into account the environment of the measurements, of where the measurements are taking place. And that's what the, the quantum potential actually is. And it violates the conservation of, of momentum because you have the future affecting the past as a negative frequency. And normally... When you're using um, a complex um, linear superposition 
of particles in the in quantum physics, you have to assume that you're canceling out the <clears throat> negative frequency because it has to has to be measured as in a as a real number <clears throat> as a real number in the space time continuum. But since you're um, relying on the non commutative discrete algebra, then you don't have to use you don't have to rely on a real number that cancels out the negative frequency. And so that's why you get this, um, what Alain Kahn calls primitive time, which really, it just corroborates the original Pythagorean philosophy where you have the discrete natural numbers with the future overlapping with the past, enabling um, precognition and anti-gravity levitation and dematerialization and creation transmutation and um, long distance healing and um, all sorts of other telekinesis <laughs> telepathy okay thanks for your time